Good evening and welcome to the 2022 NCBA Annual League Meeting. My name is Sandy Sanderson and I'm President and Founder of the National Club Baseball Association. Since the league formed back in 2000, we've annually held a league meeting such as this to help educate our member teams on their inner workings of the NCBA. The initial meeting was far less tech-based than what our capabilities are now, as 12 team reps met at a hotel in Washington, D.C. Now, thanks to technology, we can have this meeting coming to you right in your very own home so that we can reach a larger portion of our membership. As you may know, the pandemic slowed down the growth of the NCBA, but I'm excited how well we bounced back, returning to two divisions during the 2022 season. As you'll soon learn about during this meeting, we're making another major stride towards the NCBA's return as we'll officially be reinstating NCBA Division III for the 2023 campaign. We are excited to have you and your fellow officers following along as we proceed through this journey, as we will be discussing where the NCBA has come from, where it is headed, and how we can help make the most of your collegiate club baseball experience this season. Without further ado, I'm proud to introduce tonight's meeting host, the Vice President of Baseball Operations, Eric Curator. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah, first and foremost, we just want to say thank you to everybody out there for tuning in. Um, obviously, you guys are either just starting class, going to be starting soon, so thanks for uh, spending your Wednesday night with us. Um, this is going to be a real productive meeting for you guys, whether you're a first-time officer or just a player. A um, lot of great information we're going to go over here, so uh, let's get to it. Uh, big important thing here, uh, you can download the meeting slides, everything that we're going to be going over um, sequentially here, right off the website, uh, coldbaseball.org. So uh, if you want to follow along with us, please download the slides there. How to ask a question. So you're going to see this randomly throughout the night. We'll uh, send out reminders. Um, this, or, excuse me, this league meeting is interactive. So um, you know, please type in your name, team affiliation, and question in the comments section, um, no matter what your question is. Big or small, we'll get to it. Uh, NCBA staff, whoever's presenting, will answer it. Um, if I don't know the answer, whoever's presenting doesn't know the answer, we'll find out for you. Um, and it's nice for just to uh, have an open discussion for you know people learning about different opportunities or you know the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, so don't be shy. Go ahead and ask a question. Uh, so National Club Baseball Association. You can see our company info there, our phone number, our address, our website. The agenda for tonight's meeting. Uh, first, we're going to meet the staff. We'll uh, introduce everybody there. We'll talk a year in review, 21-22, what's to come um, for this upcoming 22-23 season. We'll have some breakout sessions uh, from anything from marketing to, to paperwork, just uh, general information, and then uh, we'll get the closing going. So let's meet the, uh, the front office. You just met Sandy Sanderson, President of the League, uh, Vice President of Baseball Operations and Marketing is myself. Uh, Director of Division II Baseball Operations is Jimmy Henderson. Director of Division III Baseball Operations and also our rolling sponsor account manager is Mike Galletti. Our treasurer is Sandy Sanderson Sr. Our accounting specialist is Mikey Battaglia. Uh, the game sponsor account manager is Felicia Battaglia. And our two rules reps. Uh, Division one is Joe Karachi. Division two is uh, Chad Lowe. And lastly, our direct director of umpires, excuse me, is Ryan Hastings. So this is division one. Um, our regional directors, as of right now, North Atlantic is myself. Mid-Atlantic is Stephen Baker. South Atlantic uh, was Mike Letty this past year, but you'll notice um, right next to that we're looking for volunteers because Mike's actually going to be transitioning in, into our Division Three role. So yeah, if you guys are interested, it's a great resume builder. It's a great way to get your foot in the door with the NCBA. Um, a lot of great experience. So please go ahead, send us your resume, send us your emails. If you're interested, um, you know, we'll look into you. We uh, could always use the help, and uh, like I said earlier, it's a it's a great uh, resume builder for you guys to get involved. Great Lakes, Ryan Bresner. Gulf Coast, Ryan Norris, Mid-America, Evan Ford, North, uh, the Northern Pacific is Dave Stahl, and Southern Pacific is Nick Trulio. Um, and shout out to these guys. A lot of these guys are volunteers, um, former NCBA guys. Um, they dedicate their time to uh, you know help us run this league on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, we owe them a lot. So um, those are the D1 regional directors. Division two, Chesapeake, Mike Smith, New England, Antonio Saka, uh, Dixie is Jimmy uh, Henderson, our D2 director. As you can see right there, he's looking for volunteers as well. New Penn, Gary Robinson, uh, Northern Plains, Jeff Bober, Great American, Mike Galletti, Rocky Mountain, Dave Stull as well, and Pacific, uh, Jimmy, currently, but we also are looking for volunteers on that front as well. 
Uh, meet the Division Three staff. Uh, you'll notice Mike Galetti. He's our Division Three uh, Director of Operations. Um, as Sandy mentioned earlier, we are bringing it back. We are very excited. Um, it's been a couple of years. Uh, we first had it in 2018. Um, we were gaining momentum, and then the pandemic hit, and unfortunately, we had to take a couple of steps back. But here we are in 22-23, looking forward to Division Three. Um, Mike will be heading that up, and we are start from scratch in terms of uh, um, district coordinators. So if you guys are interested, maybe a current player, or former player, alumni, um, maybe just an NCBA enthusiast, uh, reach out to Mike. Um, you guys can be a great fit, and uh, we need some volunteers. Again, download those meeting slides right off the Club Baseball website there. Um, you can follow along with the presentation. So let's look at last year, 21-22, um, a year in review. We're going to talk about growth, rules changes, membership, and uh, everything that happened in the postseason. So this is a nice little chart we put together. Um, you can see 2000 was our first year. We had 34 teams, um, which was awesome. We built all the way up to about just over 300, excuse me, within uh, 18, 19, and 2020. Um, pandemic hit, unfortunately. We took a big step back to 42. But I will throw out there, we were very excited just to have that. Um, you know, we did a lot of work. Uh, shout out to all the teams that were participating that year. Shout out to the volunteers, the front office, front office staff, excuse me. Um, you know, we were really proud about that year. And um, as you can see right after that, we got back up to 275 this past year. And, uh, you know, this next year we're looking at ho hopefully 300. So um, things are right back to where they were. And hopefully we'll just keep taking off from there. So last year, we had 45 states covered. Um, we even had an international team in Windsor, um, which is awesome. You know, that's the majority of the country, plus a, a Canadian team. So um, it's really awesome to see the NCBA go coast to coast and internationally. So uh, that was pretty cool. So rules that were changed last year. And I'm going to keep saying last year just because I don't want people to get confused, you know, Okay, this is a change for this coming year. We will talk about that later, um, but for this section currently, this is last year. Um, and I won't go over every single one just because there's quite a bit there. Um, but, you know, we did make some changes in terms of um, suspending some rules uh, just because of everything that went on with the pandemic and COVID. We had to create some roster flexibility um, to help guys who test positive. Um, we had to make our eligibility rules a little, uh, I wouldn't say more lenient, but, um, you know, we had to open up some circumstances for um, some COVID eligibility waivers, things of that nature. Um, you know, we, uh, courtesy runners, some, you know, uh, just to help out the league throughout the pandemic, um, long story short. So you can see all the rule changes that we did last year. Um, we suspended a couple other things in terms of non-conference game requirements. We took that away. Um, certain things to kind of just help everybody get out there and play baseball. Um, a lot of those schools did not play two years ago, so this was the first time back. And, uh, you know, long story short, we wanted to help as much as we could while still having a very competitive, balanced, um, legitimate league. Some more rules. Um, again, this is last year. Um, as I touched on the non-conference games, we suspended that. Uh, I mentioned about the roster flexibility for uh, guys who test positive for COVID. Um, and the one thing w which was funny that we had to add, uh, you know, in the world of college athletics, it talks about um, name, image, likeness. So we had to put that in our rule book, too. So that was something we did last year. So 2002, this past year, this past May, um, our Division II league, we had eight regional playoffs. Um, all eight were at a neutral site. Um, I put in parentheses, we, you know, we're always open to recommendations. We, we'll, we'll say it every year, you know, we don't know every field out there. Um, we really sometimes rely on you guys to help us, you know, whether you went to high school, whether you play travel ball, you had a showcase, um, you know of a great turf field somewhere, we're always open to listen, whether it's a regional site, World Series site, anything, fall tournament. Um, anything across the board. We want to learn about more facilities across the country, so please don't be shy. Um, I'll probably say that a couple more times as we talk about more tournaments, but um, the more fields we know about, the better. Um, all eight regional playoffs for 14 double elimination. Um, the NCBA, our front office, we covered everything expense-wise for you guys because basically you qualify for the event. You shouldn't be worrying about, you know, paying for the fields, paying for the umpires, getting the trophies. Um, we helped you guys with hotels. We get room blocks for you guys. Um, we want you to worry about as less as you Basically, the only thing we want you to worry about, I guess is a better way to say it, is playing on the field. Um, this is the playoffs. It's what you play the whole year for. Um, we want you guys to, uh, to focus on that and let us do the rest for you. So our 2022 World Series, we're out in Butler, PA, Pullman Park. It was our first year there. Um, we did hold a Division II World Series there back in 08 or 09 off the top of my head. Um, so we're familiar with the facility. It's uh, about an hour north of Pittsburgh. It's a great, great facility. It's got a lot of history in itself. 
Um, it's been around since the 20s or 30s, if I remember correctly. A lot of former major leaguers have played there. Um, it worked great. I thought it was a great event. Um, shout out to Jimmy Henderson for running his uh, first World Series event. Some of the factors that we considered when choosing um, this facility was field availability. Um, a lot of people don't realize that we need a facility for X amount of days exclusively, um, which is a real big ask. Um, so that's usually the biggest hurdle. Um, obviously, pricing needs to go into it. You know, does it have lights? Um, how eager is the city to help us with the resources around us? Um, is it a baseball town? Um, what's the hotel situation like? So there's a lot of variables that go into it. It's not just, hey, I know a nice field. Maybe you should use it. Um, that's a great starting point, but unfortunately, there's a lot more that goes into it. So. Um, but back to the 2022 D2 World Series, Grand Canyon, um, phenomenal tournament. Shout out to those guys. Um, they were great, and uh, they're our defending champs in Division Two. Division Two World Series, um, you guys can see a nice little chart here. Uh, it's the NCBA Travel Fund Assistance. So basically, kind of like what I was saying uh, earlier with the regional playoffs, um, we want to do all we can to help you guys. Um, obviously, these trips are not cheap. We understand that you know a lot of you guys are flying, a lot of you guys are renting cars, a lot of you guys are, you know, paying for everything out of your pocket. And as a college kid, we understand that's a that's a tough task. So, we do our best to provide you guys as much as we can. Um, obviously, we'd love to give you guys more, but um, you know, we're excited that we can at least offer this to you guys. Um, so basically, this breakdown is how much the pot was each year, and keep in mind it's a prorated off distance. So Grand Canyon got more than, say, Cal PA, who was in the backyard of Butler PA, and Grand Canyon came all the way from Arizona. Um, so this pot is divvied up, prorated by distance. So Division I, um, same idea. We look to hold all tournaments at neutral sites. Uh, many cities across the country expressed interest. Um, each uh, tournament was a four-team double elimination. And same idea as Division II, discounted hotels. We get you trophies. We cover all, basically, the... Um, logistics of the event so you guys basically just need to worry about showing up competing and uh, you know trying to earn a World Series bid and you notice on the bottom there I, I put again um, you know send us those field recommendations we are always looking for more and more facilities if it's turf even better um, but the more the merrier <coughs> excuse me the 2022 Division One World Series uh, we held it in Greenwood South Carolina at Bulb Only Stadium it was our first year there I thought it was a hit. Uh, it was a great event. You can see a picture of the field. It's fantastic quality. Uh, Lanard University, which is in Greenwood, South Carolina, was the host. Um, they're a Division II NCAA school, uh, a very good Division II NCAA school. Um, so they had all the amenities we could ever need um, as far as facility. It was a nice, um, I don't want to say smaller, because smaller is not the right word. It was, a, it was a tight atmosphere. People were on top of each other. It was a nice closed-in fit. Um, obviously, it had the stadium seating, but it created a really cool experience for um, the teams. You know, when uh, you know, big plays happen or, you know, tense moments, it got loud and uh, it, it created a very cool atmosphere. Um, so, yeah, some of the big factors, same as Division II, uh, rental cost, availability. Division One, we need it for nine days, which is even bigger um, of an ask. So that's uh, extremely hard to find. So that cuts down the search automatically uh, right away. But uh, another big thing we always look for is the eagerness of uh, the city. Um, how much do they want us? How much are they willing to help us? You know, if we try and bring this event to a big city, Chicago, Dallas, um, Las Vegas, we're just going to be a blip on their radar. Um, we got to feel like we're wanted, um, like they value our event, and they're really going to put some bells and whistles into us being there to really make the event um, what we want it to be and what the teams deserve it to be. So, um, and Greenwood did a great job with that. We're happy, um, and uh, I thought it went great. Florida State, shout out to you guys. You had a great tournament. Um, you know, defending champs, Division One. Uh, Division One travel fund assistance. You can see here the breakdown. No need to, to um, go over the process. Same as Division Two. It's prorated. Um, see the breakdown here. Yeah, we're really excited to give um, an opportunity to provide back to you guys, given the amount of expenses that this trip takes on. It's just natural that you guys are going to be spending money. Um, so we're excited that we're going to give you guys something. Hopefully, we'll keep this building as we go. As you can see. Through the list, you know, there were certain years where, you know, it was higher and then it was lower. Um, you know, we started Division Two back in 07, 08. So that's why the, the fun went down. Um, you know, the pandemic hit 2021. We weren't able to offer anything. Um, but we were back at five this year. And hopefully, you know, in the coming years, we'll keep that going up and up. Just a friendly reminder how to ask a question. Uh, type your name, team affiliation, and question in the comment box here. And the uh, NCBA staff are on site, or excuse me, on the, uh, on the set will answer it for you. 
All right, so now we're looking at next year, what's to come. We're going to talk new teams, realignment, we'll talk some rule changes, and then we'll have some breakout sessions. We'll talk team operations, tournaments and championships, sponsors and fundraisers. So new teams. Jimmy Anderson in our office is doing a fantastic job. Um, he's our director of new team development. Um, he's reaching out to anybody and everybody. At this point, we're actually very fortunate. Teams are actually coming to us, which is great as well. Um, but as of today, 14 teams have signed up. You can see the list here. I won't read them off one by one. Um, we expect more to be uh, to, to be registering within the weeks because, um, as everybody knows, the season will be starting very soon here. So um, Jimmy's main focus right now is signing on those teams. And uh, as of right now, we got 14, and we expect a lot more. So it's, uh, it's exciting. Just some random teams that have expressed interest, and I don't mean random in the sense that um, – you know, they just came out of nowhere. We have been working with them. Uh, we have other teams as well. This could probably be updated to a much longer list. Um, you know, we're in talks with many, many, many different teams. Um, but hopefully these teams who have expressed interest um, kind of graduate into a verbal commitment to hopefully joining the NCBA one day. So this is just a list of teams um, that are kind of in the early stages, but hopefully we'll see them back soon. So realignment, that's probably one of the biggest questions we get uh, this time of year. Hey, when's my conference schedule coming out? Hey, who am I playing? Um, long story short, it is in the works. We actually had another meeting today. It started earlier this week as well. It's a very complex process. Um, it's basically a big puzzle. Uh, so we take all the teams that we have membership paperwork from and put them in basically the pot and then we got to break everything up in each conference you know break it down we want to minimize travel as much as we can that's a huge thing for us but we also want to make sense of everything too um, and division three just kind of threw another hurdle into it which we're excited about but it's just another hurdle in the sense that some of the division two teams move down to division three and then you take those new teams who also come on the d3 or they're going to be a d2 team we don't know if they're going to have d3 in that area so it's just another hurdle um, but we're excited you know we're, we've we're pretty close. I think we're on the goal line. We've made some great strides. Um, you know, Division One will have a couple of changes, if anything. Um, you know, we have a couple of new teams, or excuse me, Division Two teams that will be joining Division One, which we're excited about, which we'll announce soon. Um, Division Two should have, you know, more changes, but nothing drastic. And then, uh, obviously, we'll have Division Three, which is exciting. Uh, do make a note, though, that we will have this. Hopefully, by the end of the week, maybe next week, we'll start making announcements on. You know who has moved up, who has moved down. Here's the alignments. You know we'll be emailing out your your conference outlooks, and we'll start working on those schedules ASAP. So the NCBA rules committee, uh, D1 elected teams rep was Joe Karachi. Um, shout out to Joe. He's a former ECU head coach, two-time national champ. Um, he's been around the NCBA for a long time. We're really appreciative to have him here. Chad Lowe, uh, head coach of Ohio State, he's been around the NCBA for. Oh God, I don't even know. Twenty years. Um, you know, he's a valuable resource for not only us front staff, front office staff guys, but the uh, the teams. So, these two guys are your rules rep um, representatives to you know bounce any changes you guys want to see throughout the year. And you know, these are the guys that basically gather your feedback. Um, our committee is basically made up of seven members: it's the president of the NCBA, the VP of the NCBA, D1 and D2 league directors, the at large regional at large regional director, excuse me and both elected team representatives. So our meeting this past year, which was for this coming year, 2023 season, was set on July 23rd. Um, and basically, we took all the suggestions from the year, um, whether it was from a team, whether it was from front office staff. We debated, we voted, and uh, that's how we got the, how, how we're gonna get the new updated rule book, which will be coming out in a couple weeks here. But um, we had a lot of great discussions. You know, as the years go on, um, teams, or even us for that matter, we recognize certain things need to change, certain things evolve. The NCAA has certain things that change on their end. Sometimes we adapt it, sometimes we don't adapt it, but it, I mean, it sparks good debate. Um, so everything was discussed. However, not everything was voted on. Um, and that's not to say that we didn't want to vote on it. We just didn't feel like it was worthy enough of a vote to get to the point where we want to see it implemented. Um, but that could change next year as like I was saying things evolve things change so you know this coming year if you think of anything that you would like to see change whether it's gameplay anything with the rule book specifically by all means email us email the rules rep guys um, we want that feedback and then we'll present that at the rules meeting um, next summer so this is this year um, and again I won't read every single one of these just because um, it's quite a bit but uh, these are posted on, on the websites. They've been posted on social media. They've been emailed out to you guys. Um, I'll take a peek at it real quick just to see if there's anything of note. Um, you know, we're really into you guys posting stats. We really want to see that. Um, it's something we have struggled with at times just because, 
you know, how do we make you guys want to do it? What's the urgency behind it? Obviously, you guys can get all Americans, you can get the weekly awards, but you know, is there more on top of that that you know could push you guys? We don't know. So we're trying to do everything we can. It makes you guys look good. It makes us look good. It makes our website um, look that much better and that much more legit. So we are really we're open to anything at this point to, to hopefully get you guys to to put your stats in. It'll be big for everybody. Um, a couple of big items I am seeing here, um, fall eligible teams. So Division One, there's a handful of conferences that are eligible to play in the fall. These last couple of years, we, or through the pandemic years, we took away the rule that mandated you guys play in the fall, at least one schedule series. That was just to help you guys get, you know, flowing back into things, get back on the field, you know, at your own pace, um, you know, just to slowly work you guys back in. We've gone ahead and brought that rule back. So... It's in your best interest, long story short. We want you guys to play in the fall. Um, a lot of you, all of you guys, I guess for that matter, have tighter windows in the spring to play because of your weather. A lot of you guys can't get out of field until late March, if you're lucky. Some even worse in April. Um, so it's in your best interest to get out there and play in the fall, whether that be one conference series or two conference series. Heck, some teams have even played a third if they know they can't touch a field until April, like the Dakotas off the top of my head, um, other teams in the New England Midwest area. but. Um, we did bring that back, so all you fall eligible teams will be required to schedule at least one conference series. If you want to play more, great, tell us, awesome. Um, but we will be scheduling you at least one conference series this fall. Uh, excuse me. Uh, another big item was pace rules play. We got a lot of requests about that. We see the NCAA, NCAA, excuse me, doing it. Um, so basically, what we're going to say is we will enforce it, a force a warning. Um, by the umpire. It's not something we're going to mandate. You know, you don't have to have a clock on the side. We're not going to stop watch you guys all the time. Hey, 20 seconds between pitches, whatever the heck the rule may be. Um, just be mindful of it. It's pace of play. You know, we want to keep games moving. We definitely keep an eye on it, you know, in the postseason when our staff is there. But um, when you guys are playing on your own during your conference games, non conference games, um, just be mindful of it. So, you know, um, keep the games moving. It's in everyone's best interest as well. Um, we created, or excuse me, modified the um, details into the uh, rule 7.03, which you can see second from the bottom there. Uh, what constitutes as a satellite campus? This comes up every now and then from schools that have multiple branch campuses, satellite campuses. You know, Penn State has eight to ten different branch campuses. Wisconsin has a million. I feel like half of them in our league, which is awesome. But other um, other schools, they have different branch campuses and satellites that. Um, kids go to and they want to play for the main campus so we've had to make rules about how you're clear to play at that main campus uh, one of the things that have come up in the past couple of years are bridge programs um, you know if I go to Penn State but I go to a local community college next to Penn State which has no affiliation to Penn State but you know through my um, being enrolled at the community college I can use Penn State's facilities I can play in their club sports I can you know basically have the same access as all those Penn State students, am I eligible to play for Penn State? In our eyes, you are not, because you are not a student at Penn State. So that's something we kind of cleaned up a little bit. Um, bridge programs are not satellite campuses. Um, that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, we cleaned up our three-way ties verbiage, just because we've had a couple instances come up in the past. Uh, you know, you get those first teams that, or excuse me, those first three teams, they all tie for the conference title, um, and what happens? Um, you know, we our rules we thought were good, um, but you, you always see something that you can clean up, um, and that's what, exactly what we did. We cleaned it up. It's the same rule. Um, we just cleaned up the verbiage to, to help make things more um, clear, the clarity of it, um, I guess is the best way to put it. So we updated that as well. Uh, moving right along, uh, we made sure that, you know, we've seen regional playoffs have games. Sometimes only one team plays on Friday, the first round or half the first round, excuse me, plays on Friday. And then the other half has to play on Saturday because of weather um, or whatever the reasons may be. We want to make sure that both of those games are played in the same exact format and we're not jeopardizing or giving an advantage or disadvantage to somebody that played Friday or Saturday. You know, we can make it seven innings. We can make it nine innings just to help. Um, but we want to make sure any game that's in the same um, t uh, tier, round thank you jimmy uh same round um uh, is the exact same we don't want to give advantage or disadvantages um you know obviously we can assess after the fact if weather becomes an issue um and mind you this is a division one only thing because division one plays nine innings um all throughout the postseason division two seven innings across the board so this is nothing division two teams need to be worrying about but 
Um, division one, this is something that's come up in the past, and we just had to clear that up a little bit. Um, we've also put in for division one, two, and three, the number one seed will get the choice of if they want to play the early or the late game. And mind you, this kind of case by case, um, you know, some teams are farther away than others. Some teams want to play earlier so they can have the night off to then rest for their games in the morning. Um, it's kind of a preference thing. In the past, we always just kind of gave the night game to the one seed, but in the past, we've gotten some feedback but, uh, as saying, you know, we are the one seed. We'd rather play earlier to get the night off. Um, it's an advantage or disadvantage in everyone's eyes, I guess, kind of, uh, you know, case by case kind of thing. But, you know, we're going to give that option to the number one seed. Um, some small things we added, uh, you know, bold in our line only for the pitcher. That's in reference to DHing. Um, we get that question quite a bit, no matter Division One, Two, or Three, I guess. Um, you know, only for the pitcher. You can't DH for the second baseman. You can't DH for the catcher. You can only DH for the pitcher. Um, hopefully, that's been pretty well established in the past. But we're going to do our best to bold and underline it. So hopefully, you guys will see it even more. Um, we went ahead and allowed the NOPAC East, the North Pacific East Conference, which is in Division One, to be eligible to play fall games. Excuse me. Um, that's just because of their weather. Uh, they face a lot of snow um, early on in the spring, and those guys can't really get out in the field until uh, you know April. So it's in their best interest to try and knock out a series or two in the fall. So we went ahead and allowed them to play eligible, excuse me, to be eligible for games in the fall, um, which is really going to help them uh, when the time comes. D2 only rules, uh, these last couple on here on the page. Looks like we got a question. Our first one, go ahead, Sandy. Hey, Eric, I wanted to chime in right here real quick because uh, uh, Nate DiPerno from SUNY Cortland uh, had a great question. His question was, if there's a free weekend on our fall or spring schedule and we wish to play a team that's actually in our conference, would it be counted towards our conference play or is it acted as a scrimmage since it's not on the schedule released by the NCBA? And one of the things I wanted to comment with here, I, I wrote a big lengthy comment for everybody to read there that we encourage you to play as much baseball as possible. You know, if you have openings in your schedule, schedule any other team. Go outside your conference. Go in, stay inside your conference if you want. Go to a different <coughs> division. If you're in Division Two, try to get a game or two with a Division One team or a Division Three team. Um, those games are all considered non-conference, which means they uh, don't impact your conference rankings. So they don't impact whether or not you um, make the playoffs or not. Only the conference games impact your standings within your conference if you make the, the, the playoffs. One of the big things I wanted to comment on here is we play three game series because it creates a national tie, natural tiebreaker. One of the things we encourage teams to do is schedule four games on a weekend, right? If you're driving, say, three hours to play a team, play two Saturday, play two Sunday. The first three are the conference games, but that fourth game is a great opportunity. You're already there. Play a fourth game, get a fourth pitcher a start, get some guys off the bench. That fourth game would be considered non-conference, even though it's against a conference opponent opportunity to get more baseball and get more guys playing that's going to strengthen your program uh by getting more uh you know kids off the bench playing and you know as they get older maybe they're freshmen as sophomores and juniors you're going to rely on them more they're going to be bought into the program more if they've got more playing time as a freshman so that's my comment on that, that that's a great point and something else that randomly popped in my mind too is um non-conference games are great for your resume you know, we're really excited in Division One that we have every region has three conferences. So there's an at-large bid in every single region. We're very excited with our realignment talks right now that Division Two is going to be back to three conferences per region. Um, so there's going to be at-large bids all throughout Division Two. So one of the big things non-conference games can do is, excuse me, not yet. Yeah, non-conference games can really bolster your resume. Um, if you go out of your way and you want to play Division One teams, you want to play, you know, teams that you might be up against for that at-large bid. Should you both finish second in your conference? That's a great look for you to say, hey, I took two out of three from this team. There's no way they should be adding me for the at-large consideration. So um, that's just another random thought in my head. But, yeah, as Sandy was saying, play more games. It's great for you guys to get out there and kind of get more practice. Um, but as he was saying, too, you know, it's great for the guys um, that maybe not won't get in the games, all your conference games mostly. Um, you keep them engaged. You keep them around. You build up the program. You kind of just build up your system. So that, that's a great question great point, too. Um, that last uh, rule here, um, reversing D and D1, excuse me, and D2 rule 3.012. Um, Pre-pandemic, and I might have touched on this earlier, I can't remember, um, we required you guys to play so many non-conference games um, throughout the year to be eligible for the postseason. In Division 2, it was one game. Uh, in Division 1, it was three games. 
we brought that back this year. So the last two years, we kind of suspended it. Um, as I was saying earlier, we wanted the last two years to be, hey, get back on your feet. We're happy you're playing baseball. We're going to ease you right back into it. This coming year, um, we want to bring that back. It promotes playing baseball. It promotes getting out there and, uh, you know, getting more experience, getting more baseball in. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's something we're excited about implementing back. And, uh, you know, hopefully you guys can make note of that so you can start building up your non-conference schedule once your conference schedules come out, which, um, as we'll talk about later, should be very soon, within a week or two for you fall teams. For you spring-only teams, <clears throat> excuse me, it should be within a month or so. All right, I'm going to take, uh, take a little break here, get my voice to rest. I'm going to bring up Jimmy Henderson. Um, he's going to talk some team operations for a little bit with you guys. Thanks, Eric. Um, <clears throat> as he mentioned, my name is Jimmy Henderson. I am the director of Division II Baseball Operations, um, and I'm going to be covering session one here with team operations. Um, just a reminder how to ask a question. Type in your name, the team you are with, and your question in the comments section below the video, and our staff member will read your question, and the current speaker will answer accordingly. First up is our league participation agreement and registration form. Um, you know, they were due July 1st, so they're due now. They're past due. Um, and this is your ticket to solidify and secure your spot into the league for this season. So if you do not have those in yet, they need to be in today, ASAP. Um, as Eric talked about a little bit, we are in the midst of realignment. Realignment is almost finished, so we are moving quickly, and the season is going to be getting started. If you are not in with your LPA and your reg form yet, um, once realignment's done and schedules are released, we're moving forward. Um, your contingency on being in the league this year could come down to a vote with the conference that you would be in. It would have to be a majority vote to come back yes, um, and you don't want to get to that point. So just get them in now before we're finished with that so you are secured. Um, and on the registration form, those are just as important as the LPA, so we have the most up-to-date contact information for your club, um, so when we need to get a hold of you for whatever reason, um, for reschedules, for questions about games, chasing down scores, whatever it is, we need to know who we're supposed to contact and include your advisor on there as well. Should we not be able to get a hold of you, that's, that's where we're going to find out what is going on with the club. Next, the schedule request form. Um, I'm not sure where Eric sits on the Division One teams, but at the Division Two level, half of you guys already have this, and if you haven't, um, you're going to be getting it soon, within the next week or so. This is how we make the conference schedule. This is your opportunity to tell us what your requests are as far as when do you want to be home, when do you want to be away, when do you want to be off because of you have a non-conference series scheduled or there's a home football game on campus? Um, whatever reason, you don't want to play that weekend, so be it. Um, but that is how we make the schedules. We take your whole conference's schedule request form into consideration, try to meet everybody's needs there, um, and then get those back to you as soon as they are finished. And then I want to mention, too, the more flexibility, the better. Um, that helps us help you in turn um, to give you guys what you want schedule wise if you now if you put on there all home games are all away obviously that's not going to happen um, but don't list a bunch of games like that or a bunch of games off either the more flexibly the better for us to, to help you guys in return for your schedule um, next the general liability insurance um, this is part of your league dues um, you guys are covered under our insurance policy um, all of our member teams, it covers uh, half a dozen things with travel, practice, your workout, your games, World Series, the full postseason. It's full coverage. Um, we can add fields on. This helps you obtain and secure fields. Um, and if your field needs to be added to the insurance, that's fine. There's a $75 charge to do so um, to cover that field, but we're happy to do so and whatever we need to do to help you guys get a field. Um, going off of reserving fields, when you are the home team, you are responsible for securing the field um, in addition to umpires and providing the baseballs. Um, but talking field-wise, do not procrastinate. I'm sure if you if you were in charge of this last year for your club or you were on the team, you probably heard guys talking about it. A lot of our teams, they 
um, can struggle to get a field. There's a lot of baseball being played between high school, travel ball, tournaments, and what have you. Um, so don't wait. As soon as you get your schedule, um, work towards getting that field secured for your home games, and you need to communicate to your opponent where that field is and what time your games are going to be. Um, like it says there, don't wait a week before you play. As soon as you have something reserved, let your opponent know, even if it's two weeks, three weeks, months out. Um, the sooner the information, the better, and then just make sure to relay any changes that you have on that information. Scheduling umpires, um, good resources. Contact your local uh, high school AD. Contact your umpire assigners. Talk to other teams in your area, whether they're NCBA, um, club teams, high school teams, travel organizations, whatever. Any baseball team that you have in your area can possibly help. So reach out to them if you need help. Um, as far as getting the umpires, they just need to be high school certified or better. Um, same thing, don't wait a week till before you're going to play. And something that's not listed here that I recommend um, that can help with this, go to your high school athletic association website and uh, search on there for umpires. You should be able to find a board or an assigner um, close to you that kind of covers your area at the high school level and they can probably help directly and even if they can't they should be able to point you in the right direction to somebody that can okay moving on to some website stuff um, team manager access and online player registration um, the team manager somebody within your club should be designated as the team manager as far as our website is concerned. Now they request access from us to um, get the access to do that and they will receive a team code to where each individual player on your team, that is how they register um, their profile on the website and the team code is what ties them to the team. They will sit in a registration queue um, and we'll talk about this, I'll talk about this on the next couple slides. Um, once the, an academic eligibility letter is in, they send their registration queue and get accepted from that registration queue after they register. Um, team manager also is responsible for inputting your stats onto the website. Um, as Eric mentioned, we're excited about being able to provide you guys the opportunity to have your sticks online, showcase what you guys have done on the field, um, and in addition, it ha helps us pick player of the week nominations and uh, all Americans at the end of the year when that time comes. Coaches participation waivers. Um, any coach that's going to be in your dugout, manager, trainer, anybody that is not a registered player on the NCBA website that is going to be in the dugout needs to have a coaches participation waiver on file. Um, there's no exceptions to this. This just allows them to be in the dugout um, without liability on anything so just kind of the thing to take away is anybody that is going to be in the dugout coaching your team that is not a registered player on our website will need to fill this out turn it back into us so we have it on file okay as I mentioned um, about the academic eligibility letter that's tied to registration um, you can find this online under our info tab on uh, our website all three um, websites with our three divisions and we'll also be emailing this out when the time comes uh, it's really straightforward um, you can go off the sample letter that we give you and just go off of that or or you might have something within your own school but the gist of it is every player will name will need to be on that form and then once it is ready to go to the school it will need to be sent to the club sports director um, or your faculty advisor or the registrar to check your academics um, for eligibility you must be a full-time student, um, a 2.0 GPA, no academic warning or probation. Once that is verified by your school um, and you're in the registration queue, you will be accepted onto the roster um, assuming you have eligibility. And we have um, stuff on the back end of our website to where it will tell us if something needs investigated as far as eligibility goes. Uploading player stats and team information, um, as I went into a little bit earlier, you guys have the capability to put your stats online and we've actually implemented a rule to where you have to. You have until the following Thursday, um, following any weekend of games, to upload your stats. If you do not, you will be subject to probation and any other uh, disciplinary type of stuff. The team manager, 
as uh, we'll have the access to do this. It's self-explanatory and straightforward once you get in there, but they will be uploading stats for each individual for every single game that you guys play. And again, that's how we pick Player of the Weeks. That's how we pick All-Americans at the end of the year. Um, before this year, it was encouraged to do so. Now it's it's going to be mandatory. We've um, put in the work to an effort to build our website to the point to where it's it has the stats for you guys, and we want you guys to use it. Just a reminder to ask a question at any time. Please do. This is an interactive uh, meeting. Type in your name, the team you are with, and your question in the comments section below, and our staff member will read your question aloud for everybody to hear. Weekly team submission form, um, and this ties into to stats and submitting scores for your games. After each time you play a game, your weekly team submission form is due by Monday um, at midnight of the following week. Um, so don't do not confuse that with the stats you have until Thursday to actually enter the stats on the website, but on this weekly team submission form, your stats for the week and your scores for the week um, need to come onto this form, one, for us to input the stats into the website, and two, for your Player of the Week nominations. You have, um, there's two spots for each, a Player of the Week and a Pitcher of the Week to where you can nominate your guys, and then on Tuesday, we will pick a player from each conference um, to be the player and pitcher of the week. Moving on to dues. Um, with your dues, you get one Bibicor certified bat, six or five dozen baseballs, depend on what the league you are in, and you're included on the general uh, liability insurance policy, um, in addition to other tangible items, access to us, uh, or intangible items, I'm sorry. Other tangible items are a D1 and D2 teams get a full set of catcher's gear or eight batting helmets. You have the choice of one over the other. Um, D1 and D2 teams, if they forfeited any games or for whatever reason they don't have their performance bond rolled over excuse me, um, from the previous season, that will need sent in, and that is due by September 15th. If you did not lose any of your performance bond last year, then it is just rolled over um, from the previous season to this season. So that is just something to be on the lookout for. If you do owe it, we will be in touch um, to let you know that and with an invoice. Um, dues, uh, 2160 for Division 1, 1905 for Division 2, and 1650 for Division 3. Due in full by February 28th, you do receive a discount of $100 off if it's paid in full by December 31st. Um, and we can accept credit cards with those um, or a check. Um, credit cards are subject to an online handling fee of 3% of whatever you're going to be invoiced for. And if you need um, an invoice for your records or a receipt for your records, just ask us and we can get that to you as well. Okay, back with uh, team operations and uh, boosting team interest and team morale. Um, the big thing here is a team that has cohesion, plays together, does things outside of baseball together, um, performs better on the field. Some ideas that we have, student involvement fair for incoming freshmen, uh, get your school paper, uh, weekly newsletter, whatever you guys have on campus, get the word out about the club team, how you guys are doing. If you're starting a team, um, just whatever the buzz is around your team on campus, make sure that other students on campus have access to it. That's a way to grow your team um, and let people know and get the word out that there's a club baseball team on campus. We play in the league, um, and we want to grow our club. Um, boosting team morale. Like I said, get the team together off the field just as much as being on the field. Um, a team that likes each other, has cohesion together, can perform better. Things such as social events, group activities, were all included, can, can build strong bonds, which lead to more success on the field. Um, and a great way to do this is spring training. You're going to have a long car ride or bus ride or flight down to Florida. You're going to spend a whole week down there, and then you're going to get back home. You're going to get to know each other very well, um, and you're going to get to play teams that you probably normally wouldn't get to play. Um, and you're going to play at a great facility. So our spring training event is something we're really proud of, um, and we think it goes a long way of um, building your team chemistry. And as well as uh, something, I don't have numbers on this, but a lot of the teams that make the postseason and make the World Series go to spring training. It's more games for your team. It's games in early March 
or whenever your spring training is um, that you might normally not get to play. Some teams last year did not weren't able to practice until they got the spring training. So all in all, it's just a way for you guys to get on the field earlier and get more work in. Um, when you're on these road trips, set room assignments to break up the clicks. You know, everybody has quote their closer friends on the team or, or the older guys that have played together for longer. Break them up on with the room assignments. Uh, it's, it's a good way for you to know players on your team. You may not get to know them that well. Um, until you do something like this, and it's just a great way to boost team morale and, and get to know your uh, teammates better. Looking good can make players buy into club philosophy faster. Um, things such as practice gear, um, just apparel, the club baseball team apparel, just anything that you can do that looks like a team um, is going to help guys just buy into what you're selling. Make, te- make guys be more adamant about getting to practice or getting to practice on time or just have a better overall feeling about the club and the direction it's heading. Um, teams that look good, on the, look good, feel good, play good, right? So anything that you can do to kind of follow that philosophy, we recommend and you can see the results on the field. Budgeting. Um, very important to set an accurate budget and even to uh, budget high. You never know what type of expenses are going to come up or when costs are going to rise. Um, and it's better to have more money that you know what to do with come the end of the year than the other way around. So budget high and make sure you're setting uh, accurate expectations for your budget. Make sure to include things such as umpires, field costs, uniforms, hats, equipment, travel expenses, league dues, um, apparel, practice gear, practice equipment, etc. Anything and everything you can think of, include it in that budget whether you submit it at the end of this season for next year or you're working on it now, just make sure you're on top of it. It's organized, it's accurate, and again, budget higher than you think you need to. And that includes uh, budgeting for the postseason every single year. It does not matter where you think you're at um, as a club as far as how your season's going to go, wins and losses, whatever. Um, You want to make sure to prepare for uh, all the way to the World Series, and that includes hotels, travel costs, food, everything you can come up with. Because the one thing you do not absolutely want to run into is you make the postseason and it's, oh crap, where we got to come up with thousands of dollars in a couple days. Um, So make sure you get ahead of that now before the season even gets started. Um, Other income items that can uh, raise your funds are player dues, fundraisers, donations, school, anything you can come up with. Um, We are partnered with several fundraisers on our website that can help you raise money. We've had teams that have had a lot of success with that. Um, Player dues, you know, you can, this is a little bit school specific, but make sure guys pay their dues. As soon as they make the team or as soon as the new semester starts, however you do it as a club, make sure you guys get the money from your players and if they don't pay, they, they don't play. You know, make sure you're getting whatever you guys need from them, whatever uh, player dues you guys have set. Um, And going off that, how much to charge? Again, I think this is school specific. It depends what, how much money you might get from the school, how much you have left over from last year, what kind of fundraisers you guys have planned. Um, But to do something uh, for player dues, make sure to include things such as your spring training trip, Travel costs to conference, non-conference games, whatever. Maybe that includes hotels, um, renting vans, money for fuel, new uniforms, new hats, practice gear, everything you can think of. Um, Take that all into consideration when you're trying to figure out what to set your player dues at for the year or for the semester. Um, Higher player dues or more more stuff that you want to do, the higher dues you're going to need. Um, another idea, charge $5 for tryouts. Um, that's another good one. You might have hundreds of kids come out for tryouts, um, and even only $5 doesn't seem like much, but it can add up pretty quickly. Team equipment and uniforms. Um, what's bolded there and in red is very important. Be sure to order early as customized items tend to have extended lead times. Um, And even on top of that, with COVID and other supply chain disruptions that we've experienced, and I'm sure you guys have too, um, you want to get ahead of it early. Leave yourself some time for when something could get back ordered or pushed back as far as delivery goes. Order extra caps. Everyone um, 
will buy a, a hat for a fundraiser. Dads, brothers, girlfriends, uh, mothers, everybody wants to support you guys and, and what you're doing with the club. So extra hats, um, you can sell them off. That's part of a fundraiser um, that can raise a couple hundred bucks for you. Order extra pants and jerseys. Um, you know, worst case scenario, maybe they just sit there, but you have something for next year or for when a player that didn't know about the team or play in the fall comes on in the spring and you're not scrambling to, you already did your team order for the year, now you got to figure out what to do for him. Um, no, you already have one extra. So order extra pants and jerseys. Order extra game balls when you think you're starting to run low. My recommendation to new teams and all teams really, um, you get your five or six dozen complimentary as part of your league dues. Stash them away for your home games. Save them. Do not waste them on practice or anything like that. And, you know, depending on how many baseballs you lose at your field or how many games you're playing, maybe you'll need more. Um, and if you do, we're happy to help you with um, with Mike Galetti and our Rawlings um, partnership. But as soon as you think you might be running low, make sure to get ahead of that for the same reason um, with the supply chain disruptions and with the equipment and the uniforms. Um, get quotes from NBA sponsors. Um, you know that's that's why we have partnered with them because we think they're beneficial to you. So make sure you're using them. You can find all of those on our website under the sponsors tab. Um, and Eric Curatory or uh, would be happy to help you answer any questions there. The guide to collegiate club baseball. This is something that uh, we have put together to help new teams or even the returning teams just get a feel for how the season goes, how it runs, things to look out for, things to um, get ahead of, and everything in between. Um, I don't want to go through all the bullet points there, but you know, get on there and make sure you're taking a look at it and then come to us with any questions you may have. It's, it's very long, but it, it has a lot of great information in there that can help you guys um, answer questions within yourselves or maybe you find something in there that you didn't really think of before. Um, and it was made by our staff, um, which a lot of us played club baseball in college. So we know how it goes from you guys' end, from an administrative point, um, and it's been made to help you guys. So please utilize that. And then to finish up session one here, this is just a little bit of a timeline of kind of how the, the season goes. As mentioned, renewals and LPAs, we're kind of past that point, but please get those in as soon as you can um, so you make sure you have your spot. In mid-August, early September, that's kind of where we're at now. Once realignment is finished, we will move on to scheduling and releasing those conference schedules. And as soon as you guys get those, um, get ahead of it, secure your field, secure your umpires, Reach out to your opponents about any information that they're going to need. December 31st, that is uh, kind of the, uh, the league dues are due if you're going to meet that discount period where you save $100. The actual dues are not due until February 28th. And then you get into March where the Spring Training Showcase is in Panama City Beach and Spring Training West in Mesquite and Henderson. April 15th is the roster freeze. That is a hard deadline to where any player you have active at that moment um, on the website, that's that's what you have for the for the rest of the way. Up until that point, you are able to add players provided they meet all eligibility requirements. But after April fifteenth, uh, the roster is frozen, and that is what you got. The end of April, the regular season will conclude, and we move on to the postseason. Um, and then from there, it's regional and district tournaments at the D three level and uh, you take a weekend off, and then you move on to the World Series. So that is, um, you know, and that's the goal for everybody. So make sure you're budgeting for all that and just paying attention to important deadline and dates. And at any time, you can reach out to myself or Eric or Mike Galetti with any questions you have about any of these dates. And now I'm going to pass it back over to Eric Curator, where he will go over session two. All right, guys. Uh, session two. Excuse me. We're going to talk some uh, tournaments and championships, uh, fall tournaments, spring training, regional tournaments, World Series, um, all pretty much the the best of the best, the big time tournaments that we host here at the NCBA. Um, we'll talk some shop on those real quick. 
So 2022, this fall, what are we doing? Uh, we got five big fall tournaments um, that we're hosting, um, four returning, one brand new, all very exciting. The first is the Greenville Fall Invitational, Greenville, South Carolina, November 4th through the 6th. Uh, it's 12 teams. It is currently full, uh, but we are accepting a waiting list. I'm actually running that, so if you have any interest in it, please let me know. Again, you don't know if a team's going to drop out. Um, we might expand if we get a lot of interest. Heck, you never know. So please email me if you are interested. It's a great event. It's a three-field complex. It's been going on for, I believe, eight or nine years now. Um, it's a great event. So uh, hit me up if you are interested. Wood Wars down in Euless, Texas, November 4th through the 6th. Uh, 16 teams. It's full. Also accepting a waiting list because um, Ryan Norris, the man himself, uh, Gulf Coast Regional Director, volunteer with us, but you would never know it. Um, has put on an event bigger than that, so I'm not sure if he's open to it, but either way, it's a fantastic event. Um, I believe it's in its 12th, maybe 13th year. Um, he does everything and some that event. He's got a swing it challenge, puts all the bells and whistles into it. He makes it a real fun experience besides of just you know playing games. Um, it's a great weekend, um, and I know it fills up within a day or two, and there's a good reason behind that just because of how great of a tournament that is. The Battle Creek Blast in Battle Creek, Michigan. Uh, Mike Galetti is running it in our office, uh, 12 teams. It is full. Um, again, though, accepting a waiting list. It's September 30th through October 2nd. Um, like I said, Battle Creek, Michigan. So if you're in that area within four, five, six hours of it, uh, and in, or you are interested, excuse me, uh, hit up Mike. Charleston Fall Invitationals will be the second year. Really excited here. Uh, last year, we tried to get it together kind of short notice, um, I would say, and we only got six teams. But now we're up to 16. It's a beautiful facility. It's four turf fields, um, all in the same complex in a circle. It's uh, we hosted the the Mid Atlantic Division One Regional Tournament there. High quality facility. It's brand new. I believe 2019 it opened. Um, awesome event. 22nd through the 24th of October, Charleston, West Virginia. Um, 16 teams. Like I said, it's full. But you know, hit up Jimmy if you were interested. If you were in the area, um, it's going to be a great event. The last one, brand new for this year, we're excited about State College Classic, State College PA, um, where Penn State University is obviously located. Uh, eight teams, Wood Bat, Antonio Saka in our office is running it. Um, it is currently open, um, but we are fielding interest, fielding teams. Hopefully we can fill that up within a week or two um, and get that going. That's something we really want to bring back. We had it in the past, um, you know, maybe five, six, seven years ago. Took a little short hiatus, and uh, now we're bringing it back. So we're looking forward to uh, cementing that back as one of the yearly tournaments, and hopefully we can get a, a strong showing this year. So this past year, our 2022 Swing in the Spring Henderson, um, which is just outside of Las Vegas, was the 21st to the 27th. Shout out to Alec Veroff in our office for running a great event. Um, you can see the teams listed there that participated, uh, 11 in total. Six teams from the uh, Rawlings top 20 polls between D1 and D2, excuse me. Um, as Jimmy was saying, there's a pretty good correlation between teams that you know go out of their way and be proactive with playing. Um, these are the teams that are usually either better on and off the field, they're doing all the right things. Um, so really take advantage of these fall tournaments, spring training tournaments. Um, these are great opportunities for you guys to get out there and get more baseball in. Uh, but this event specifically, there's 24 games played throughout the week. Uh, the cost, you can see the breakdown of everything, what to expect. Um, these are NCBA sanctioned games. Uh, they counted towards your overall record and stats. Um, and as I said earlier, Alec Verhoff in our office is the man that runs it. So if you are interested in uh, coming to the 2023 event, which we'll probably talk about in the next slide, please let him know. Um, the other event along with Henderson is Mesquite, which is also on the West Coast. Uh, last year, uh, this past spring, we held it through the, excuse me, March 3rd through the 5th. Uh, participating teams can be listed there. You can find them right there. Um, eight teams. Two of the teams, two of the eight, uh, were ranked teams. Um, Fifteen games that played between three days. You can see the cost breakdowns there. Again, NCBA rules apply. These are NCBA sanctioned games. Um, great practice. Uh, great trips for you guys to take. Um, I can't stress enough. You know, it's funny to say I've been working here for 12 years, and um, I still remember stories and people that I was playing club ball with back at Bowling Green uh, every time we went down to Tampa for a spring training event. Those trips are, you know, once-in-a-lifetime memories, not only off the field, but, heck, get on the field. It's great practice. Um, knock out your non-conference game requirements, which we talked about earlier. Um, but above that, it's just really fun to get out there, bond with new teammates, um, your freshmen, guys you don't know. They come out of their shell a little bit. Um, it's just really a great opportunity for you guys to get out there and get some games in, too. And, and again, Alec Verhoff in our office is running this, so if you guys are interested, please hit him up. 2023, as I was just referencing, um, we are 
definitely going back to Henderson, Nevada, um, 15 miles outside of Las Vegas. Heritage Park is the field that we use. I believe it's a two-field complex, March 27th through April 2nd. Multiple fields. You guys can go down in your spring break. You can go down for the weekend. You know, we'll build your schedule around you, whatever your preferences are. So it kind of works out um, on both ends, both of both worlds. Registration paperwork will be out um, in the near future, and uh, looking for 15 teams this year. We had 11 last year. We want to keep that event growing. Um, and the big thing I always tell teams is it's right outside Vegas. Uh, what more could you ask? Uh, it's gonna be a great trip. Get some ball in. You know, enjoy some uh, time away with your guys, and um, you know win-win for everybody. Mesquite, Nevada, multiple fields. The date, excuse me, dates to be determined. Uh, the goal of 10 teams for next year, we had eight this past year, so obviously we want to see that event keep growing. Um, but it's a great event too, another great opportunity for you guys. So this past year, um, our first year in PCB, Panama City Beach, extremely exciting. Uh, I would say two years ago was our first year we signed on, um, and then COVID hit, and unfortunately we couldn't get out there. But it's probably one of the nicest facilities you'll ever see. Um, we'd like to think it was built for us. It's got five to six all turf fields right on the beach. Um, you know, it's it's just awesome. You know, you guys have an opportunity to play on high quality fields and enjoy your spring break. Get down there, um, utilize the beach, utilize all the amenities that being in Florida offers you throughout your spring break. Um, it's just a really fun time. Um, so last year we had 126 games played in three weeks. Um, guys that have been around maybe for a little bit or maybe knew that we were in Tampa um, at an older facility, which, you know, no knock to Tampa. We just kind of outgrew the facility. This facility in PCB is night and day. Um, as I was saying earlier, all the turf fields, all the amenities, being on the beach, um, it's just one of the, probably the best decisions we've ever made as an organization is to uh, get this down to PCB. So we're really grateful for the opportunity. And hopefully you guys can take advantage of it. Um, we'll talk about a little bit more about it, the event in a little bit here, but um, you know, definitely reach out to us with interest. We set up a lot of sponsors uh, last year, which are great, Hooters, Domino's, um, some local stuff, pontoon boats. We have VIP cards for you guys to take advantage of. We really put a lot of effort into giving you guys um, that much more of an experience. We want you guys to save money. We want you guys to get out there. We want you guys to give back to the sponsors that are um, in exchange sponsoring our event, helping making it a reality for us and for you teams to use it. So um, we really, really push the idea and we want opportunities for you guys to have fun and kind of utilize the area too. So moving forward to 2023, uh, looks like we got a question. Yeah, well, I got uh, Louis Carrasco from Eastern Washington, the club president there. Okay. He's asking about if there could ever possibly be a fall tournament out in the Pacific Northwest region. Absolutely. And to be fully transparent, it's something that we want to do. It's something we've tried to do. Um, might be, I guess some could say it's harder for us because we're on the East Coast, but that's not to say that we're not interested in doing it on the West Coast. We held one in Henderson out at that same facility, actually, in Nevada. Um, Years prior, I believe it was a couple years ago, we did it pre-COVID, and uh, it's something we want to do. It's something we're looking to do. It's just a matter of getting the field space. Uh, field space, that time of year, is so hard to come by, um, whether it's colleges, whether it's MLB teams, whether it's high school showcases. Um, we need exclusive access to a facility for, at minimum, a weekend, just to make things worth it for you guys, if not longer for a week, so you guys can utilize it for your spring break. That's by far the biggest turtle. Um, so we really want to make it happen. We'd love to make it happen. And uh, if you guys have any recommendations on fields that we can lint, we can look into, excuse me, please let us know. Um, we want to make it happen just as much as you guys do. Um, great question. So 2023 Swing to Spring, uh, Panama City Beach. So registration is wide open. We are excited about it. We are getting a lot of interest. Um, as we said before, we had 50 or so teams come last year. We expect all of those teams, hopefully, if not all of them, to come back um, for this coming year, and heck, even more. Um, one thing to keep in mind is we do have a limit per week. It's 30 teams. That's not just because we don't want more teams to come, which is we don't have enough space. You know, five, six fields, you're playing every single time slot. Um, you're only capable of ho holding that many games in a week. Um, so please get your paperwork in ASAP. You know, I believe in our busier weeks last year, we had 24, 25, 26 teams. So um, we were pretty close last year, and uh, that was just our first year in the event. This second year, we expect bigger and better things. And heck, I hope we get to that 30, just because that just means the event grew that much more. So um, please reach out to us ASAP to get your paperwork in, especially if you're a returning team who came last year. Um, you know, if you're a new team uh, to the event, that is, and you want to learn more about it, we got 
sample budgets, we can answer questions, you know, we have hotel pricing, we have everything you can expect budget-wise, um, we can tell you to help you make that more of a reality um, to, to get you down there. Because once you get down there, we see, you're not going to stop going. Um, teams who first go down there, they will come back and come back and come back just because of the experience and all the pros and cons of, you know, getting the experience down there, the opportunities to play, getting better on the field, seeing teams all across the country you never see. Um, I mean, I can keep going. So uh, it's a great opportunity. Please reach out to Antonio Sack in our office. His contact information is right there. Um, you can see the cost breakdown there, too. But, yeah, if you're interested, it, it can't hurt to reach out to Antonio and uh, get that conversation going. Uh, some more info I was kind of touching on earlier, lodging. Um, you will be required to stay with the, the lodging partners we have set up, but it's actually in your best interest just because we negotiate room blocks for you guys, exclusive rates, the availability is there, um, which is in your best interest just because you know what you're getting and you can plan for it, and it's in, it's on a tee for you, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, you don't have to go around and shop around options and you know worry about the stress of, hey, where am I going to stay? How much is it going to cost? We take care of it for you. Um, one less thing for you guys to worry about. Uh, benefits, as I was saying, it's negotiated discounts. All you guys are getting exclusive pricing, exclusive opportunities, um, multiple lodging options. I believe they had five, six, uh, maybe even more last year. You know, some are on the beach, some are not on the beach. Some are, you know, suite style. Some are just normal hotel style. Some cost more than others. Some cost less than others. Um, everything ranges across the board, and kind of whatever fits your fits your needs, um, we offer. So please reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, you know, we can help help you along the way. Uh, there's a great picture of the facility, uh, along with the one from the earlier slide. Uh, yeah, it's a great facility. It kind of speaks for itself. And, um, you know, it's a great opportunity for guys all over the country, but especially for those teams in the New England area, Midwest area, uh, you know, those crappy weather areas in March where you're leaving snow. Come down south, play in 85-degree weather. Um, it's great. So uh, definitely look into it. All right, let's switch games a little bit. We're going to start talking about the playoffs. Um, this is next May. The regular season concludes. So uh, Division Three district playoffs, May 5th through the 7th. Um, our goal is to hold these all at neutral sites, um, formats to be determined, and basically that just means we need to see what we're working with. Um, we have a very good idea of our Division Three outlook at the moment. Um, while it's not official, it should be later this week, so we should know how many teams we're going to have, what the outlook's going to be, how many conferences. Um, and at that point, we will then know, hey, you need to win your conference, or hey, you need to finish first or second. So long story short, more information will be released later on that. Um, but yeah, just stay tuned for the format on that. But same idea as earlier as any year re previously, excuse me. Um, discounted hotels, we'll provide trophies, umpires. We'll do all the, the legwork for you guys. You just show up and play some baseball. 2023 Division uh, 2023 Division Three World Series. There's a tongue tie right there. Currently looking for a neutral location to host the event. Um, we're fortunate in the sense that we have a lot of good relationships around the country. Um, and mind you, Division Three is going to be more East Coast. Definitely more Midwest to East Coast. Um, so we do have a lot of relationships, but at the same time, heck, we want to learn about stuff you know about too. Um, if you've got great facilities that could be a great option for us, let us know. Um, the more the merrier. It's planned as a 14 tournament hosted over a three day span. It's going to be May 19th through the 21st. And uh, like I just said, four teams will be determined by the eventual Division Three district alignment, which we should hopefully know by later this week. Switching over to Division Two. It'll be May 5th through the 7th, 2023, obviously next spring. Same idea, we look to hold all these events at neutral sites. Many cities across the country um, have expressed interest. Uh, we've gotten to the point with our Division One and Division Two leagues that, um, especially Division One, I guess we could say, that this, the locations don't change very often. There's little to no realignment there. Um, so we've used a lot of the same facilities over and over again just because we're fortunate to have a good relationship. It's a good facility. We have a lot of great um, contacts in the area, and it's worked out well. At the same time, we have other cities who are coming to us saying, hey, how do we get your event? How, what do we need to do? What do we need to provide? Um, so it, those are good problems to have, but at the same time, as we keep always saying, you know, if you know of great fields, let us know. Uh, we'll provide you guys the same things, discounted hotels, championship trophies, anything and everything on and off the field. Basically, you just show up and play. Compete for a World Series uh, berth. Division Two World Series, uh, same idea. Currently looking to for a location to host the event. Um, we are in talks with Butler, PA, where we were last year. But at the same time, we are exploring any and all opportunities across the U.S. Um, just because we don't know what else is out there. Um, so yeah, we are we're knee deep in that, to be honest. Um, 
you know, once this alignment thing gets behind us, um, one of the biggest things we'll be looking towards is regional playoffs, World Series sites, um, just because of the amount of complex planning it takes to put those on and basically find those facilities. So it's something we're really going to be looking forward to next month. Um, but like I said, Butler PA is definitely an option, and, uh, you know, we'll, we're happy to explore any and other options as well. Same idea as last year. It'll be an eight-team event, five-day span. It will be May 19th through the 23rd. Each of the eight regional champs will be represented. Um, as we've been saying, if you have any recommendations, hit up Jimmy Henderson, our Division II, Division II uh, Director of Operations, to uh, give those leads to him. Division I, uh, 2022, we look to hold those at all neutral sites. That should, be, should say 2023. Many cities across the country, same idea, expressing interest. Um, all eight regionals of 14 tournaments. We provide everything on and off the field. It's got hotels, trophies, the whole nine yards, as we've been saying over and over again. Um, and again, if you have any fields, please let us know. Um, oh, excuse me, next year, there's the slide, 2023, uh, May 12th through the 14th. Um, we're looking to hold those at neutral sites, but as I was saying earlier, we do have a lot of great relationships on the Division One level, just because the um, outlook in Division One is more consistent. It doesn't change as much, so the central points kind of remain the same. Um, and through that, we are able to use the same facilities over and over again. Um, but that doesn't need to say that, hey, maybe that facility won't be available to us next year, or hey, maybe we can't find another one. So, you know, let us know. 2023 Division One World Series. Um, again, we are looking at to return to this place where we were last year, um, Lander University. We worked out great. It was our first year, and um, you know we're open to all our opportunities across the country. So, feed us the leads. We're more than happy to look into them and uh, consider everything and anything. Um, we are on the books for May 26 through June 1st. It's an eight-team event, seven-day excuse me, seven-day span over for eight teams. Uh, May 26 through June 1st, we'll have all eight regional champs represented. And uh, please send any fields you have um, that you think might be a good fit um, to myself. Information's there. All right, moving along to session three, we're going to kind of make a left turn here. Um, we're going to talk some sponsors and fundraising. Myself, Michael Eddy, and Felicia Battaglia in our office. Um, we'll touch on some great sponsors, some discounts, some requirements, and uh, you know, a lot of the information behind the ordering process. Uh, sponsors of fundraising. So we got a lot of them on board, a lot of great partners that we're working with, Rawlings, Motel 6, Fundraiser, Easton, um, who you may or may not know was recently acquired by Rawlings. Um, so they now fall under the same umbrella, which is exciting. So now we have access to both vendors, both brands. Um, and lastly, the game. So the first one I'll touch on before I get out of here and let these guys talk about the other ones is Fundraiser. Um, my contact information is there. Um, basically, Fundraiser is a fantastic option for you guys to raise funds. Um, it's very similar to GoFundMe, but we actually like it a lot better um, because we find it's more user-friendly. Um, it, it lets you keep a bigger percentage of what you, you raise. So if you raise $10,000, you know, GoFundMe is going to take a check out of that. Um, Fundraiser will take a smaller check, so you keep more. Um, so it works out well for you guys. And I had to paste this picture of Cal Poly just because it was ridiculous what they did. You know, hats off to those guys. They're our new poster child for fundraiser. Um, they raised $17,000 in a week, I think it was. Uh, these guys won their region out in California, the Southern Pacific region. And they, uh, they're they going to the World Series in Greenwood, South Carolina, three time zones later. They needed to raise some funds and uh, started a fundraiser. And boom, $17,000. So... Um, you know, we've had many of these instances in the past. Obviously, they, they've, these guys, excuse me, have raised the most. But um, you know, lots of teams have raised thousands of thousands of dollars that can help towards uniform expenses, umpires, uh, facility costs, travel, you know, spring training, uh, fall tournaments, whatever you guys need it for. Um, this is set up and provided for you guys to take advantage of. So last year, our NCBA teams raised just over fifty-six thousand dollars, which is a ton. Um, hats off to you guys. Um, like I was saying, that kind of money can help facilitate, you know, your expenses towards anything and everything across the board. Um, this is club sports. We know you guys are working on tight budgets, uh, college kids, no less. Um, so the, the opportunity for you guys to raise money should be uh, should be one you take advantage of. So hopefully you guys look into it. It's great. It's easy. You guys share it all across all social media platforms. It's very user friendly. Um, you know, I can go on for days why you should be using this. Um, at worst, try it. Um, you know, a lot of teams just say, hey, let's see what happens. And, you know, a week or two later, maybe a month later, they raise thousands of dollars and, you know, everybody's happy. 
Again, how to ask a question, type your name, team affiliation, a question in the comment section um, to the right there, and uh, we'll answer it for you. All right, moving along, equipment sponsors, uh, Easton Rawlings in the game. I'm going to go ahead and pass this off to Mike Galetti. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Mike Galetti. I am the uh, Rawlings account manager, um, and I'll be obviously D3 kind of moving forward. Um, so I do everything. I do the ordering. You guys kind of just reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to help you in anything. Any questions, you know, jerseys, um, any gear you want, gloves. You guys want batting cages, you know, stuff like that. Not batting cages, but um, tops, whatever works for you guys. I take care of all that stuff. Uh, you know, Rawlings rep. He's really great. Uh, he's makes my life very easy so anytime you guys see anything Rawlings you shoot me an email call me uh, email usually works better just because it's easier to confirm stuff here and there um, but obviously phone call we can start that process whenever you guys would like uh, moving on to the next one so I know they mentioned it earlier um, all teams uh, get balls and stuff like that um, so usually you know you get D1 gets six dozen D2 gets five dozen uh, D3 gets five dozen as well um, usually when you guys are ordering new balls, uh, it's usually about a 10 to 14 day lead time. Uh, that's a pretty good kind of window there. Usually it's you know a little bit faster. I think I just shipped some softballs out and that was within seven days. So baseballs are pretty good, but you know, be weary with, you know, they mentioned earlier with COVID and supply line, stuff like that. Everything's kind of taking longer. You know, it's not quite like ordering like Amazon and stuff like that. You know, Rawlings just a, a different beast over there. They're, they've got a lot going on. Um, but if you guys want practice balls, you know, especially the new teams, you know, I don't, you know, we don't have to come to us, but, you know, practice balls are $42 a dozen. Um, there's a minimum. I think you have to order at least two or three dozen. Uh, otherwise, you would pay a little extra. But, I mean, that's a pretty good price kind of going forward. Um, but if you guys need anything like that, balls, anything like that, just shoot me an email or phone call. Um, so we're the, obviously the official uniform supplier. Uh, if you can see that out, down there, it's the 45% discount until November. Uh, that ends uh, November 30th. And then the next one, kind of 35% goes down. That ends in June. Um, and that 45% is not just for uniforms. That is for catcher's gear, gloves, hats, any tees, ball, you know, all that stuff, whatever you're looking for. Uh, that, and that is not just teams, so if an individual player is looking for a catcher's mitt or outfielder's glove, you can they can order that as well. And just being a part of the team in the NCBA, uh, they get that discount as well. Um, in terms of pricing, the the jerseys they are uh, it's based on the fabric you choose. Now uh, there's four uh, options. So there's a the travel ball fabric, there's the collegiate pro uh, or the collegiate fabric. That's the most popular one. That's kind of the Higher quality, middle of the road pricing, you know, kind of where teams, you kind of get the best of both worlds, higher quality, um, and a little last longer, you know, especially the new teams. Um, the pro is the most expensive, but the best quality. Um, a lot of these teams, they order jerseys with no names so they can kind of move forward and use the same jerseys, you know, for the future. If you're going to do that, pro is kind of the way to do that. They last longer. Um, like, and the fast track, fast track is exactly what it says you're going to get them faster you know the lead time for jerseys is roughly five weeks the fast track a little bit shorter than that but quality goes down so if you're looking for you know just a quick jersey for the year that's the way to go but i would recommend collegiate or pro those are definitely our most popular uh options and this one so the sublimated, I don't, if you guys don't know what sublimated is, um, it's basically, there's no um, embroidery, there's no stitches or anything like that. It's all built into the jersey. And in my opinion, that's the way to go. It's the best way to do it. You have the most creative freedom. You can do whatever you want with it. If there's no extra cost. You can do any colors you'd like, you know, as long as, you know, they're accepted by your university or uh, anything like that. But that's the best way to do it. You can, have, you can design them however you'd like. And they can match the pants as well. Sublimated pants are the same thing. If you have baby blue jerseys, you're going to have baby blue pants. It's completely up to you and what you'd like to do with that. Um, I made a note about vector files. If you don't know what a vector file is, it's basically a high-resolution image. So a lot of your universities have that on file. Um, the, the media and the um, design department usually have those because they use the logos for obviously other things, ads and stuff like that. So you'll need that to get to Rawlings and Rawlings will put that on the jersey. 
Um, there is a fee if you don't have it. So, like, if you want the Georgia Bulldogs on there or the, you know, Ohio State Buckeyes logo, and you, you know, Ohio State doesn't have that, they'll go to Rawlings, they'll create it for you. That costs like a hundred bucks, hundred twenty bucks, and they'll create it for you. Um, and once again, like, if you order jerseys, um, it's roughly five weeks. I would, but if you're ordering a lot, I would get those orders in. You know, we had teams last year because of supply line issues that didn't get jerseys at all. Do not fall onto that train. That is not good for anybody. So on the next slide, these are kind of the uh, some jerseys that are out there. Uh, Seminoles, the Florida State, baby blue is great. Uh, you can barely see it on the shoulder, but they used a personal logo there. Um, you can certainly do that. Same with Florida underneath. These are all great options. They look great. You know, teams love them. You get a lot of compliments. You get great on the field. And what Jimmy said earlier, look good, feel good, play good. I recommend that 100%. So as I stated earlier, 45% uh, discount is not just on jerseys, but it's also on gear and bats and whatever you'd like. Um, D1 and D2 teams, uh, and, well, if you're being a part of the NCBA, um, you guys get stuff. D1 and D2 is catcher's gear or a choice of catcher's gear and helmets. Uh, whatever it works best for you guys. Some guys come in with catcher's gear. Uh, when I played at Bowling Green, we did helmets usually. Um, have some hot heads, you know, you might break a helmet here and there. Don't recommend that, but it happens. Um, so if you guys have any questions about that and the, the catcher's gear and the helmets, um, we'll be sending out a survey. I'll mention it again. That's coming out in the next couple weeks, and then we'll get shipping information, what you guys are, what your choice is, stuff like that. All the all the goods coming your way from Rawlings and Easton. Same thing at the bottom. High quality apparel, 45% discount, 35%. You know, I would get all this stuff in before the holidays. Once you kind of get close to March and April, it gets a little, you know, not as for sure that you'd get it on time for you know whatever you're looking for. Um, cage jacket shorts, pullovers, all that stuff looks great. I mean, this is from Rawlings, what I'm wearing right now. I love it. I wear it all the time. Um, and then anytime you guys order a jersey through us or uh, through me and Rawlings, the NCBA logo will be on your back pocket of your pants and on the back of your jersey. Uh, if you don't order through us, you just don't have it on your jersey. Um, and I would recommend it. The NCBA, NCBA logo is great. Looks good on the jersey. Um, they did a really good job designing that. Um, last but not least, uh, all NCBA teams will receive the new 2023 Easton ALX. Um, that's part of the survey thing. We'll talk about shipping information. Uh, I've used the bat. I've swung it. Phenomenal. Um, I've played baseball. Love it. I would definitely recommend the bat. But once again, we'll send that survey out in the next couple weeks, um, and then we'll get all that information going, and then we'll get those orders submitted, and you guys will be looking good, and you guys will get your new gear. Uh, if you got, once again, if you guys have any questions from me, um, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, we will uh, just reach, call, reach out, call me, uh, whatever works, and we'll get that going. Uh, next up will be Felicia Battaglia to talk about hats and her company. Hello everybody. Well, for those of you that are new, uh, my name is Felicia Battaglia. I am the game sponsor account manager. Um, I think I'm going into my eighth year here. So if you're returning, we have met before. If you're new, uh, welcome. So I'm going to talk to you about your hats. So my job is to help you from the design process, the whole way through the invoicing, the billing, um, dealing with the game back and forth while they get your artwork done the whole way through the end until they ship to you the hats ship to you um, I handle all of that so because you are required to wear the game brand hat um, it's in your rule book we get to know each other very well <laughs> over the season um, now is a great time to start placing your hat orders or at least start getting your designs ready uh, there are still delays because of COVID with manufacturing and producing and the entire process. Um, it, things are moving a lot better, a lot faster than they were before, but we're still not back to how we were exactly 
before all of these things started. So I would encourage everyone to please start gathering your designs and talking about what you want to do with your art and everything and get in touch with me. I do reach out to all of the teams individually, so if you hadn't heard from me yet, you will hear from me. Um, but I have the unique job of talking to everyone in the league. So whether you're D1, D2, D3, doesn't matter. Um, you all hear from me. So I look forward to getting to know you and putting your hats together. Um, the best way to get a hold of me is through email. Um, Felicia.Battaglia at coldclubsports.com. You can also give me a call on my cell anytime. Send me a text message. Um, it, there's a lot of you that I'm juggling around, so it might take me a little bit to get back to you, but I will get back to you for sure. Um, right now is the early order discount period where you get $2 off the already low price that the game gives us. Um, I would really encourage you to take advantage of that. That's now through November 15th. After November 15th, when that sale ends, we enter the holiday season. So if you've ever been to the mall or order things online, you know that things get crazy for manufacturing. So th if you order during that time period from between November 15th and let's say January, there's no guarantee that you're gonna get it for the start of the season. So I'd really, really try to, to push you to order before that November 15th to take advantage of the sale and to also um, get your hats in time for the season. So the process. First you design your hat unless you want to go and reorder a hat from last year. Once I have the amount of hats that you want and the sizes, a shipping address, a phone number, I send you an invoice. Once you've paid, I can place the order with the game. Then they start putting together your new art or gathering your old. Once the art has been approved by you and your school, then we move into the production time. Production is taking six weeks from the time of artwork approval to be made. Once it's been made, then they ship it. If it's coming from, if it's custom, it's coming from overseas. If it's stock, it's made here in the U.S. But there are delays on both ends. So again, I would encourage you to start the process earlier so that when the time is ready, we can pull the trigger on your order and get it placed. Even if you're not playing until the spring, I would encourage you to start this process early in the fall so when you're ready to place your order in November sometime, you'll have them for that spring season. The game holds the majority of licenses for our schools. There's a handful of schools that they don't carry, and for those schools, we offer the blank cap, which you get a, a lower discounted price. Um, you get the back NCBA logo, and it, it'll be on the back of your hat here. And that goes on every single hat. You just don't have a front logo. Once you receive your hats, we send them out or you send them out to somewhere that's licensed for your school. But there is only a handful of schools that the game doesn't have a license for that we have to go that route. Um, so let me show you the hats. Anytime you're looking on the website, which is thegameheadware.com, if it says perforated, that means that there's holes in the side. If you're playing, it gives your, hat, your head more room to breathe, sweat. A lot of people tend to like those. Whenever you're designing a hat on the, on the game's website, these are the eyelets, this is the button, the visor, and this is the crown. You can split the colors in the crown, or you can pick the front, you can pick the sides and the back, you can make it one solid color how this is. This is a flat visor, you can curve the visor, you have a lot of options. The good thing with that is, the game gives us one flat price for all the hats. So, to get this hat, it doesn't matter what the color is, it doesn't matter how the visor goes, you get the front logo, the hat, and the back end CBA logo, all for the same price. The only way your price changes is if you add an extra logo to the side or in the back above the NCBA logo. So our set price is $21 a hat. That's a really good price, but right now you get an extra $2 off, so they're $19 a piece. That's really a good deal per player on your team. So I'd, again, I'd really encourage you to use that sale. Um, you can also sell to friends and family. Uh, we sell boonies. This is an example of a boonie. You can do a solid. You could do one with a stripe. And then the game will put your logo on the front of these as well. Um, you won't get the NCBA logo on the back, but you will have your team's logo. So a lot of people like these, um, and they try to gather an order. 
again, friends and family to use in the spring. So you can go to thegameheadware.com. You can view the full catalog. You can pick a model. You can design it up online so you can look at it right there in front of you. You can pass it around, show your team, get some ideas together. Once you have your design, you email it directly to me at felicia.pataglia at coldclubsports.com and then we go from there with the quotes and everything else that goes along with that. So I look forward to hearing from you. If I haven't heard from you yet, I, I will be reaching out to you very soon. And now uh, we can get started. So I'm going to pass this over to Eric. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks, Felicia. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, everybody here in the office for uh, doing their job, presenting their slides, giving you guys great information. Thank you for everybody at home tuning in. Um, we will have a lot, or excuse me, we won't be live. We will have a recording of this posted all over social media, our websites. Um, we'll get it out to the teams via email. Um, so be on the lookout for that in case you missed anything. Um, in case you want to you know, rewind back and look at specific parts, uh, we'll get that out to you guys soon. Um, promote the week on the website. You know, we really rely on a lot of different moving parts in this. Um, obviously, we can do all we can, but we really rely on you guys to um, promote the league to sponsors, to your fields, to the pr prospective players, to anybody really, your parents, family, friends. Um, the website, share that baby around. Um, that's why it's important to put your stats up. But share that baby around. A lot of great information on it, um, a lot of great documents, a lot of great information of stats, uh, everything from postseason information to spring training, the whole nine yards. Um, please promote that. Give the sponsors business wherever possible. At worst, um, I ask is just give get some price quotes. They're free. Um, obviously, with the game, you're required to wear that, so please get in touch with Felicia ASAP to get those orders in if you haven't already. Um, but as far as you know, fundraiser or, or Rawlings Easton, um, Motel 6, anything else of that nature that you're not required to use, please just reach out. The quotes, um, it's high-quality stuff, um, especially in the uniform and equipment side. Um, it's free just to find out how much stuff is. So please just reach out, and uh, most of the time it's going to work out for you guys. Whenever an issue arises, please notify us. Communication is by far the biggest thing. I think it's even mentioned later. Keep lines of communication open. We would like to be in tune with what's, with what's going on. Excuse me. We want to know um, if you guys have a problem. Please come to us early. Come to us often um, before anything kind of gets to a point where it's out of our hands. Um, we'd like to be in the loop of everything that's going on and help you. Um, that's what we're here for. We are full time here at the NCBA, and uh, we want to make your experience as positive as it can be. Let no question go unanswered. That's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we're here to help. So if you guys have any questions, you know, new officers, new leadership, um, you guys are stepping into the role for the first time, please come to us with any questions. We are here to help and uh, keep this well-oiled chain running along. Uh, please be prompt meeting deadlines. Um, you know, we when we ask for your scores after weekend, we'd love to have your scores by the end of the weekend. Um, sometimes it's like pulling teeth. We want to make sure the website's updated. We want to make sure people who are tuning into the website to see what the latest updates and scores are can get that information. Um, please be prompt with those deadlines, uh, you know, payments, uh, paperwork, anything. Um, it's going to make both of our lives easier at the end of the day and uh, more enjoyable, uh, better experience for all. Lastly, it's a game, so let's have some fun, huh? See you guys out there.